Is the sound good? Uh, Kristen, can you hear me? <laughs> yep, I hear you. Almost noon, so we are about to get started. I was just uh, testing out this slide here. Um, let me see. Okay, I've turned on closed captioning. Um, hopefully you can see that. Um, and yeah. Hopefully um, you can't hear my dog uh, tip tapping and snoring because he tends to be kind of noisy. He doesn't bark, but he makes a lot of weird sounds. So if you hear <laughs> like a pattering noise, uh, that is my Sharpay. <laughs> okay, I think he's gonna go sunbathe, so, so it'll be fine. <laughs> okay, he's lying down now. Um, okay, so before we get started, for those um, who are here, I just want to note that this is a webinar format for Zoom. So if you have questions, and definitely ask questions, because this is more of a discussion type. Um, <laughs> I, I'm getting messages of no audio. It's because I was muted, because <laughs> my Sharpay was making noise and I was asking my partner if he could see the screen correctly. <laughs> so if you couldn't hear it, it's because it was off. Um, and because I'm trying to wait until it's noon for those who are, um, you know, on time or late. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, um, please note it's a webinar format. So if you have um, messages as people have been doing now on the chat, um, if you want it to be private just to me, then um, uh, write it in the chat. But please note that we do have the, the Q&A section. So if you have questions, um, you, please write it in the Q&A uh, part on, the, on your menu. Um, that way other people can also see the question and I can mark it as um, answered. Um, Dalina, solo estoy viendo la pantalla grande. Yes, I think as la presentación me dice su lema. <laughs> si está viendo la, la presentación, está bien. <laughs> Uh, okay, man. <laughs> okay, right now I'm just showing the, my presentation and um, I will be talking throughout. But yes, if you have questions, please use the Q&A part. Um, and I will leave some time at the end to answer the questions. Um, maybe if there's like a question that comes up throughout that's very pertinent, maybe I'll answer it, but just note that there will be a Q&A kind of discussion, like 10, 15 minutes at the end. Um, so, so yeah, um, I see people using the chat and that's, that's fine. But again, if you have questions for like discussion, use the Q&A. Um, Okay, some people are not able to hear me. Oh, can people hear me now or? Okay, so, okay. I'll try to speak up. <laughs> okay. Mm. But yes, um, yeah, these are usually around an hour. Just, um, it, they're usually around an hour. Um, the presentation part will be around 40 minutes and then like 10, 15 minutes at the end, depending on how much activity I'm seeing uh, for discussion. Okay. Okay, seems people can hear me. Mm. 
Okay. You can't hear me now. It's because I'm not talking. I'm just checking the, the chat here. I don't think so. I don't think they should. Uh, Kristen, if you're there, can you see me um, in the corner? I can't. Yeah, I can't. Oh, now can people see you? Can people see me and yeah. the presentation? They can see you now. Okay. Yep, and the presentation. It looks good. Oh, I think that's what some people were, were asking. Um, and I think some questions are coming through the Q&A and the chat. <laughs> So now it's like officially uh, noon, so I am going to start. Um, sorry, I have a, my fingers keep going to the, <laughs> okay. So welcome to Photos at Noon, Latin American Street Photography. Um, I'm your host, Dalina Perdomo Alvarez. I'm curatorial fellow for diversity in the arts at the Museum of Contemporary Photography. Um, and the Museum of Contemporary Photography is the world's premier college art museum dedicated to photography. Um, we started collecting um, around the 1980s and now in the collection we have over 16,000 items. So uh, this print viewing and this photography course per se um, is all from our collection. So it's selections that I've made uh, from the collection. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, this photos at Zoom, um, is originally photos at noon and we used to do public print viewings at the museum where we would take out prints um, and you know it would be open to the public and we would just at noon uh, show prints and discuss it um, but with social distancing going on and things moving online we kind of rebranded that to photos at zoom um, hence the title so um, so yeah um, and again, just keep in mind that everything I'm going to show you, unless I say otherwise, um, is from the collection. So this is a selection I've made from the collection, um, looking at what we have um, that's related to Latin America. Um, and I just kind of put this together so we can have a discussion about Latin American street photography, which honestly is, <laughs> um, the reason I chose that title is also to kind of explore and deconstruct both Latin America and street photography. Um, you know, at off the top of my head, when I say Latin American street photography, um, I can't really like for sure say names like, oh yes, this person is certainly like a street photographer. Um, and I think, um, so that's, partially what we're going to be talking about. And okay. So probably one of the first questions that come up, comes up is what is street photography? Um, maybe um, you're familiar or you know it when you see it. Um, usually it's categorized as being candid or spontaneous and capturing everyday living. Uh, maybe when you think of street photography, you might think of um, the streets of New York and like just capturing people randomly, um, sometimes looking at the camera, sometimes not. Um, it's kind of a malleable that way. Um, but there is also um, 
I guess, some confusion between like what is street photography, what is documentary photography. Um, and so that's partially what I want to talk about here. Um, I'm not going to give you an exact definition of street photography. Uh, and I'm not going to um, be showing you all the photos I'm going to be showing you. They're not all street photography. Um, but just to give you a little background, uh, street photography, I would like to start talking about Henri Gattier Brezon, who's considered a pioneer of street photography or photojournalism or sort of like candid photography. Um, Henri Cartier Bresson started photographing in the 1930s. So this was after the surrealism movement. Um, and he was originally a painter. And he was very intent on capturing like, uh, just like what he called the decisive moment, um, just everyday living, um, maybe a sort of truth into the photographs, um, just these perfect moments um, that were captured randomly, not staged. But I want to call attention to like this moment, um, you know, that this pioneer of street photography or photojournalism or candidate photography um, was living in. So post-surrealism and during this time in the 1930s was also the poetic realism film movement in France. And the reason I bring that up also is because he did work with poetic realist filmmakers during this time, particularly John Renard, who's considered um, like probably the most famous of the poetic realism film movement or, or style. Um, there's debate about whether to call it a film movement or style. Uh, but what poetic realism did was try to recreate realism um, or like the social realism of the documentary. Um, so the reason I'm talking about that is just because I uh, want you all to be aware that during this kind of moment where street photography was kind of coming into its own, um, that's all that was going on at the moment. Post-surrealism, or maybe not post-surrealism, but after surrealism, um, poetic realism, a uh, discussion about what realism is, social realism. Um, so the decisive moment was a publication that came out later on. Um, the French title is Images à la Sauvotte, um, which roughly translates to like images on the run or stolen images or sneaky images, snatched images. Um, so I think that kind of, um, speaks to what street photography intends to be, um, kind of like stolen images. Um, also, I have these notes here that says street photography versus documentary photography versus photojournalism <laughs> versus ethnographic photography versus travel photography. And it's because I want to explore the, the intersections or the blurred lines um, of all those definitions of these photographic styles or intentions. Um, and so street photography, I guess you could say it's defined by the intent. Um, usually like the, the subject kind of defines the setting more so than in like documentary where like the setting um, or actually the other way around, um, the subject kind of defines the setting. Um, and in street photography, the setting kind of defines the subject. It's more opportune. Um, and I also have a note here of Manuel Alvarez Bravo because he's a contemporary of Henri Cartier Berson and they exhibited together. And Manuel Alvarez Bravo in Mexico, he was also known for capturing kind of like the everyday living. Um, and he was very defined by like a foot, being a photographer after the Mexican revolution. And so yeah, I just want all of these things to be kept in mind. And um, another thing about Henri Cartier Brazon is that during this time in the 1930s where he was forming his uh, as a photographer, he he traveled to Mexico on a sort of ethnographic expedition. So that's why I kind of put in the term ethnographic there. 
um, because I think ethnographic, um, it kind of depends like, you know, it could have just been street photography that you're walking around, but maybe sometimes I think like being at a certain place, um, like if you're doing street photography in Mexico, does that automatically make it ethnographic if the photographer says it is because they're trying to capture, like document these people? Um, so yeah, and let me try to, I wanted to read this quote from Roy de Carava, who is not Latin American nor a street photographer, but I thought um, it was uh, very um, pertinent to what is being discussed um, and about these blurred lines. So it says that, quote, the major definition has been that I'm a documentary photographer, and then I became a people photographer, and then I became a street photographer, and then I became a jazz photographer, and oh yes, I mustn't forget, I am a black photographer. And there's nothing wrong with any of those definitions. The only trouble is that I need all of them and more to define myself. Um, so that's kind of what <laughs> this print viewing uh, is inspired by. All those definitions coming into one to kind of explore what street photography is. Um, so everything I just mentioned, travel photography, ethnographic, documentary, photojournalism, street photography, keep that all in mind. Um, <laughs> and another thing is that I want to question what is Latin America? So both the Latin America and the street photography in the title Latin American Street Photography, they are kind of porous. They, um, you know, the, there are many definitions and they're also just hard to define. Uh, Latin America as defined, if to give a definition, sorry to come to Dick, but one definition that's used is Benedict Anderson's um, A Community of Nations. Because um, it's difficult to say it's like a geographic region because it can encompass the Caribbean, South America, Central America, and Mexico. Um, so it, you can't really say it's like a certain geographic region. But it's also not defined by Spanish speakers, which is another way that it's used, Latin America um, encompasses uh, Brazil as well, like Portuguese speaking. Um, and sometimes, um, I personally think it should, but it also encompasses like French speaking uh, nations, such as Haiti. Haiti can be included and usually is included in Latin America, even though we don't remember it, but Haiti and the Dominican Republic are part of the island of Hispaniola. Um, so, and you know, they're just like bordered into like French and Spanish speaking. Um, but that Haiti is also technically part of Latin America. So again, Latin America um, and what we think of like Latinx is usually like Spanish speakers. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to point out that Latin America is more malleable that way. Um, and it can encompass like Guadalupe and Martinique and these smaller French speaking islands. Um, so now that I've kind of put that out there, um, I actually wanted to start the print viewing off with a uh, photography that is not technically in Latin America. Um, you, it could be the finest Latinx, but again, I, as I mentioned, these terms are all kind of um, not outdated, but there's a lot of ongoing discussion about these terms, like what is Latinx? Um, so maybe looking at this, which is also not technically a street photograph or like a photograph of street photography. This is obviously a digital collage. Um, and it's by Rebel Betty, who is an artist, DJ, photographer, activist or artivist, art teacher, many things. And she was born and raised in Chicago. She's Puerto Rican. Um, and this photo, maybe if I didn't tell you, you might see the cultural signifiers of like la Latino, Latinx. And you could say like, oh, maybe that's in Latin America. Uh, but this is actually a photograph taking Humboldt Park of a 
family who has chickens and this is a little girl <laughs> holding that chicken. Um, so the reason I put this in here is because again, I want to talk about like the malleability of Latin American uh, Latinx. Um, and maybe because I think if we think of Latin American street photography, maybe we think of like candid photography taken in Latin America and maybe there are these like cultural signifiers um, that have to define it as Latin America or it has to be colorful. Um, but, or maybe that would be like the non Latinx or like the whitewash way of viewing um, Latin American street photography, like assuming it has to look a certain way. So I like this digital collage because it takes all these um, cultural signifiers um, and you know the, that colorful aspect um, and the, of course you can see the Puerto Rican flag but it kind of puts it in this floating space as well um, and yeah another thing is that Rebel Betty uses street photography to create her collage, collages or at least that's what I would say. Even though it's a digital collage, you can see certain like aspects of street photography kind of like taken into bits and pieces and, and put in there. And sometimes she takes the photographs herself. Um, sometimes she takes them from magazines, newspapers. So she also kind of adopts like photojournalism um, and she kind of just puts it in this mishmash. Um, and oh, another thing, that I wanted to say that is that this is one of the newest uh, acquisitions in our collection or additions to our collection. Um, it's part of the Midwest Photographers Project, um, which as it says in the name, it's a collection of portfolios. I think it's over, we have over 65 at the moment. Um, portfolios of photographers in the Midwest. Um, usually it's like a body of work or like a current project that they're working on. So. Um, I'm including only like four or five of her images here that I will show you now, but uh, I just wanted to let you all know that we're going to have Rebel Betty's portfolio and we just added this. This is like me premiering it. <laughs> uh, and once the museum is open, um, you, you can go here in Chicago and see uh, her portfolio. Um, we're going to have like 15 prints of her collages and some photographs as well. Um, so that's exciting. She's a Chicago Rican artist. Um, so here's another one by Raul Betty. Can you all see that? Okay. <laughs> so yes, this is another one. Um, as you can see, she uses flowers a lot, but um, mixing that with photographs that either she's taken or appropriated. Uh, I really like this one in particular because I think it does capture, um, even though it's in Humboldt Park, I think it captures um, like more like the everyday life of, or in Latin America, it, in, in Puerto Rico, we do have a lot of these car shows as well. And I think in Mexico, um, so it's, so a normal kind of outdoor hangout um, will be just to go to like a car show um, and show off cars, maybe have music playing. Um, so I think this, although it's a clutch, I think it shows that sort of candid everyday life um, of Latin America. <laughs> Someone's saying that they're sure they still see that car around Humboldt Park. <laughs> And then this one, this is not Humble Park. Um, I think this is either Pilsen or Little Village, um, but it also captures kind of like that Latinx uh, street photography. It's Little Village, I was right, okay. It's Little Village, um, which is also a very Mexican neighborhood um, of Chicago. Um, and it captures that kind of like what I would say like street life of um, Latin America, but that also translates to the US. So even though this is Chicago, 
Um, this could easily, to me, be a scene from Mexico as well, um, as like the previous ones in Humboldt Park could easily be a scene from Puerto Rico, um, that kind of street life. So I think it's interesting how um, those, um, these like Latin American communities, once they move over here, the street kind of transforms with them. If you go to Humboldt Park and go to Paso Boricua, um, maybe not right now, but <laughs> usually, um, you know, it, you get the feeling like, oh, this is, it looks kind of like Puerto Rico. Um, so I like the way that it's transformed. And I think what her digital collages do is kind of like taking those um, and putting them in there. And then you can't really define exactly like, is this Latin, Latin America or is this Latinx communities in the US? Um, and the candidness and tradition of street photography I think is what really adds to that and allows that um, to happen. Um, as I mentioned, she's also an artivist. So here's an example of a collage. Um, and you'll see to the right, one to the third one to the right down is that um, same photograph that she used in the previous collage. And then up on the, the first one, at your left, the top left corner, is a photo she took in Mexico um, of a house and it says, um, oh, sorry, I can't read that, <laughs> F the police. Um, <laughs> and so yeah, so here's like a more um, straightforward kind of collage and then over it, she puts the words, el barrio no se vende, se ama y se defiende. And uh, though we have like, 15 of her prints now in the collection. Uh, the reason I chose those is because they all have the title, um, something about the barrio. And I think um, the, the barrio is really important to me for um, like Latin American or Latinx uh, street photography. I think also I, as I was putting this together, I thought of the word street a lot and like defend the streets and take to the streets. And I really associate that with like maybe black and Latino communities. Um, I don't know, to me it means something different, I guess street um, or like de la calle. Uh, I included this one, unfortunately we didn't have the high res, but um, this is more of a candid photograph by Thomas Hawker of Chicago in the 1980s. And I think that's Humboldt Park and it might be the Puerto Rican uh, parade. Um, so I just kind of wanted to put that in there to kind of like what we're talking about, like that's Humboldt Park. Um, it, it's titled Changing Chicago because that's a series about capturing like um, Thomas Hawker captured more like Latinx and Hispanic communities in Chicago. Um, but if you go to Humboldt Park now, from the 80s to now, um, it still kind of looks like this. I mean, people don't dress like that, but you'll see a lot of flags, like Puerto Rican flag. But here's an example of a more candid, maybe that you would define it goes more into street photography. However, Changing Chicago is also a very, is a documentary photography series. And so here's another <laughs> photograph that is not street photography, um, and it's not in Latin America. This one's also in the US. Um, but I think it uses the properties of street photography, like that candidness. Um, the reason I include this um, is because, again, to talk about what is street photography and what is Latin America and what is Latinx. So this is titled The Hispanic Project. It's, it's by the artist Nikki Lee. So she had several of these projects. Um, the, the most famous one I think is the, the Yuppie project. Um, but this one, the Hispanic project, um, we have in the collection. And basically what she did, and uh, this is gonna sound weird, but what she would do is kind of like um, learn about certain communities in the US and kind of learn to kind of adapt um, aspects of it. Um, and then she would kind of, after weeks of like studying it, and again, there's like things of like ethnography here as well. 
um, she would go to the streets and kind of using this like property of street photography and candidness, she would insert herself into the photograph and then ask someone with a point and shoot camera to take the photo of her performing as part of that community. So the woman you see there talking right in the center of the photograph, that's her. Um, she's kind of trying to integrate into, um, oops, to integrate into um, these communities. Uh, but of course, there are problems with that. And um, especially recently, there's been talks of like appropriation of that, because in this one, for example, she uses brown face um, to integrate into that Hispanic community. Um, and, you know, at first seeing this, when I first saw it, I didn't quite notice that, you know, she captures the mannerisms very well, honestly, of even I'm doing it right now. Um, but yeah, she is in brown face and she's kind of trying to, so that kind of disrupts, like this might appear like a candid photo, maybe in the tradition of street photography, but really it's completely staged, completely performance. Even the person in there doesn't look as they actually look like. Um, she's also done um, blackface uh, for the hip hop project. Uh, and I'm gonna include an article on her in further reading because um, I just think it's an interesting discussion of how she uses that kind of more street photography look and, and how she uses also the concept of streets and the people that are on the streets. Um, but yeah. <laughs> and also the, the fact that it's titled the Hispanic Project and what I was talking about earlier, like the differences between like Latinx and uh, Latin America. Um, in the U.S., there's a tendency to call Latinx people Hispanic, and in you know in the sur like the surveys, you can you can check like Hispanic slash Latino. Um, usually, the difference between Hispanic and Latino is defined as like Hispanic also includes Spanish people, Spaniards who are not Latinx because they're not from Latin America, um, but Latino does include Brazilians. Um, because they're part of Latin America. So, but Hispanic does not include Brazilians. So that's usually like the difference of those terms, but Hispanic is honestly kind of outdated um, because it just refers to you as a Spanish speaker. It doesn't really say too much about like your race and ethnicity in a sense, but that's how people use it. Um, so it's kind of an outdated term. term. And um, I think in, in America, we would find it redundant to call someone Hispanic. Uh, personally, I prefer to be called Latinx. I, I would find it weird if someone called me a Hispanic or something like that. Um, so, so yeah, I just want you to think about that term. This was, of course, made in 1998. Um, it was maybe more common to use Hispanic then. I, it's still common now, um, but in, also in certain cities, well, especially in New York, um, Hispanic people are called Spanish. So I think the Hispanic kind of led the, to the confusion of calling people Spanish, even if they're not Spaniards. So I just want you to be aware of those terms as um, moving forward in this presentation and, and in your life. Um, I think everyone has different preferences of what they're called. Some people find the term Latinx to, um, and Latinx of course is the gender neutral for Latino, Latina. But some people find the term Latinx to be outdated as well because it kind of whitewashes or erases um, or produces this mix of myth of mestizaje, of like racial, racial mixture in Latin America, which I also want you to keep in mind. Um, and just keep in mind that there could be certain like indigenous communities that are part of Latin America, but maybe they're defined there are some that are defined as their own nation within Latin America, and they might consider themselves indigenous and that sort of nationality first, and then Latino second, or may, they might not even consider themselves Latinx even being within Latin America. So Latinx tends to erase that there are existing com indigenous communities, especially in like Guatemala and certain regions of Mexico, Central America, especially. Um, it also tends to kind of uniform um, 
make uniform um, the kind of like the race of Latinx, but Latinx can be different races. Um, you might have heard the term Afro-Latinx. Um, some people feel that it erases like blackness in Latin America to just use the term Latinx to encompass all that. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> anyway, now I'm gonna get back to showing you photos. Um, so this one, again, there's no street here. <laughs> and I think um, part of the reason that I wanted to include this was because I was thinking like, what would street photography be in Puerto Rico? But if you go to Puerto Rico, I feel that the same kind of candidness and feeling that is captured by street photography, for example, in New York, that kind of feeling, or if you go to like certain bustling places of New York City, I feel that kind of can like candid, spontaneous, capturing the everyday living of people is better translated by going to the beach in Puerto Rico, which is an island obviously surrounded by water. Um, and I think you can capture kind of scenes there um, that would be kind of the what is being captured in like a scene in New York. Um, I just feel like if you go to like a city like San Juan, it's a bit too maybe touristy as well. And then other smaller um, towns in Puerto Rico maybe don't have that same effect of like the bustling street photography. But again, we're seeing what we define as street photography. Um, basically that kind of candidness and spontaneity, uh, I just feel it also depends on where you are. And this one is interesting because like, it's from 1978, titled People and Statues on Beach. I'm not sure why those statues are there. Those look to be like, uh, maybe Don Quixote would be my <laughs> first uh, thought. Those are Don Quixote statues. They could also be like the Hibato figure, uh, figure in Puerto Rico. Um, but this photograph, whether it's street photography or not, gave me kind of those street photography vibes. And then um, I'm going to show you a selection of photographs from taken in Puerto Rico. So this is by Jack Delano. Um, he was hired by the Farm Security Administration in the US to go um, kind of document Puerto Rico. So you could say that this is more documentary photography. Um, but I think there's a certain candidness here that could um, fall under tree photography. And the reason I put him in here also is because I feel that though he was a documentary photographer and that was his intent, um, he kind of became part of the community and just started photographing maybe more, more candidly, more spontaneously. So he kind of blurred the lines by, um, even though he was a hired documentary photographer, um, he, he captures a certain candidness about Puerto Rico that um, is kind of hard to, to find in photographs of this uh, time. So here's one. Um, it might be a little more posed. So that's another thing about street photography. They say that once it is posed or it's more of a post portrait, it's not street photography anymore. But again, this is coming from, a, he's a, documentary photographer. Um, so it, it kind of falls into, is this post or is this not? Um, did they just look out because they saw a man with a camera? Um, looking at the camera does not disqualify it as street photography. Um, but the reason I also included this one was because then there is this photograph taken 40 years later by Dawood Bay. Um, and neither Jack Delano or Dawood Bay are um, Latinx or Latin American. Um, but I, you know, they're both American, but I, I feel they have certain ties to Puerto Rico in particular. Um, I just found interesting like the visual um, relations between this one and this one. Um, and if you go to San Juan, the shops still kind of look like this, the storefronts, I mean. Um, 
but it's interesting that this was 40 years after this one. Um, note that this was printed in 1978. Um, this was taken in the 40s, but printed 1978. Um, this one from the 1980s almost looks older. <laughs> and then this is another photograph by Dawood Bay. It's titled Parking Gratis and it's because of the sign um, back here that says Parking Gratis. It's in Ponce. Um, if you're Puerto Rican, part of why I included uh, this here is <laughs> because I thought the parking gratis in Ponce, Puerto Rico was kind of funny. I don't know if it was intentional because I don't know how far back the phrase goes, but um, if you mention Ponce in Puerto Rico, people will say Ponce es Ponce y lo demás es parking, which means Ponce es Ponce and everything else is parking. Um, and yes, we use the word parking, even though in Spanish parking is estacionamiento, but um, we, we use the word in in English and kind of. <laughs> so I think that one captures like um, just a little cultural in joke. So there's another one by Dabu Bay, same sort of set of um, photographs. Um, and I included this one also because I guess a personal anecdote. Um, I like the way he's taking it from kind of like the inside of the bus and it creates a kind of um, like these, this geometric um, kind of look. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about geometric abstraction um, a little later. Um, but uh, I think this van, I think I recognize it as um, the vans in a certain like um, transportation line in Puerto Rico that um, goes from like San Juan to like the west part of the island and it's usually taken by tourists. Uh, public transportation in Puerto Rico is awful. This is one of the only uh, transportation lines you will find. Um, and so when I see this, I kind of think of like people traveling from San Juan to the west. I think of tourists, people of like people traveling to the airport. Um, so this gives me kind of even though at first glance maybe it won't, this gives me kind of touristy vibes. And also, um, though this looks kind of like street photography, in a sense it's also maybe travel photography since he traveled to Puerto Rico and he captured this particular series um, as part of his traveling. Um, this gives me, yeah, tourist vibes. I know it's just a set of doors, but personally, that's what I see. Um, again, just a personal anecdote. My my dad drives those um, vans from San Juan to, to the West in, in Puerto Rico. So that's why I saw these doors and I, and I just kind of like recognize that. So it's just a little tidbit. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and then um, this is also by Dawood Bay, but this is in Mexico. So this was a year later. Um, and so I guess I kind of threw that in there because I wanted to also talk about when street photography is also travel photography. Um, if the person doesn't like live there um, and they go with this intention of also capturing their, um, their trip. Uh, this is also by Dao Bay in Mexico, a year after the, the Puerto Rico photos. Um, and I included this one because it reminded me of uh, photos by other photographers that I'm gonna show you now. Um, so this one by Manuel Carrillo, and who is a Mexican photographer, and this one is taken in Mexico. Um, it has uh, no date, but of course, it's older than the Dao Bay ones, but just, the kind of visual similarities with this one and this one, kind of like a crouched down person. Um, it is candid. Um, maybe it doesn't have that sort of spontaneous feeling of like, I keep going back to like <laughs> uh, the New York photographs. Maybe I'm thinking of photographers like Bruce Gilden or um, photographers that are more easy, easily recognizable as street photographers. Um, 
but I like the quiet spontaneous spontaneity of this and as I mentioned earlier, I was going to talk a little bit about geometric abstraction. Um, but I just wanted to mention that, you know, if we go back to like Henri Cartier Brezon um, and thinking of how he defined or helped define or influenced uh, street photography, photojournalism, candid photography, and the later cinema verite in like the 1950s, which was. Um, even more about capturing realism. Uh, so I like to see that line here. Um, if we go back to Henri Cartier Bazin and we think like he was coming of age as a photographer after surrealism, and you know, I, I, I just thought it was interesting to point out this geometric abstraction and maybe kind of these remnants of surrealism um, that kind of make their way into uh, street photography. It is also by Leonard Carrillo, um, and point, I wanted to point out the use of the shadows and the framing here. Um, again, going back to kind of geometric abstraction and the remnants of surrealism. There's another one, you'll see like the shadows, and again, you know, a lady in the streets. And this one, um, I threw this in there because I was as I was thinking of Latin America and the streets of Latin America, I was just thinking what is different from like um, more like candid photography or street photography in the US. And I noticed in several photographs, you could see dogs. And as I was thinking of like, if I were walking through Puerto Rico or something, um, what would I see? And you would definitely see a lot of stray do dogs and that was kind of a culture shock for me moving to the US and not seeing stray dogs everywhere or stray cats. Um, I think in Latin America, if you go, you will notice there's a lot more stray dogs. Um, so I feel that to that spontaneity, spontaneity of capturing everyday life in photographs, you might see just like loose dogs <laughs> around. Um, here's your example, uh, Manuel Alvarez Bravo. Um, it's called El Perro Viente. Um, and so it has, it might give you some feeling of the previous photographs that I showed by Cabo Bay and Jack Delano, kind of like that storefront, um, kind of candid. Uh, but then there's just a random dog with no collar, uh, which to me captures how the spirit of if you went into a uh, like a Latin American city um, and started taking photographs spontaneously, I feel that you would capture dogs in there as well. Um, and Manuel Alvarez Bravo, um, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, he and Henri Cartier Brazon exhibited together, but Manuel Alvarez Bravo started working actually a little earlier than Henri Cartier Brazon. And he is also known for kind of capturing that everyday life. And I would say that he's also a pioneer of street photography. And he was probably the first one who popped up when I thought, what is Latin American street photography? Um, Cause I feel he captures that spontaneous, spontaneity, candidness, everyday life. Um, and this one is by Graciela Iturbide. Uh, it has no date, um, but as it says in the back here, um, Partido Obero Socialista. Um, and the reason I included this is because I was thinking, what is it like to capture the spontaneity and everyday living um, of countries that are constantly under this kind of like um, revolutionary or post-revolution or expecting a revolution in need of a revolution like it is if you live um, almost anywhere in Latin America um, that several you know I would say all basically all of Latin America is under US imperialism and constantly under that you know, like overthrowing certain dictatorships often sponsored by the US um, Puerto Rico is a good example of US imperialism. And if you're familiar with like last 
year and this kind of almost revolutionary sentiment of protests that went on in the summer protest it, it's almost been exactly a year um but i feel that kind of defines everyday living in latin america whether it's overthrowing dictatorships or u.s imperialism um so i as i was thinking like what is everyday living and spontaneity in latin america i feel that you know you might capture it as photojournalism or documentary photography um but I feel like if you're doing street photography, um, you will capture that either like in like in the background as here, like this kind of like graffiti. You will capture that sentiment. It, and this translates to several countries, uh, nations in Latin America. Um, this one is um, Marcha Politica, political rally. This one's from 1984, also by Graciela Iturbide um, in Juguita, Mexico. And this one, as you can see, kind of a candid of just um, two people walking down the street, but behind you see what I'm saying of like that, you know, that remnant or that constant um, uh, presence. Uh, it, it's a salida, like the freedom. Um, and then this one doesn't have to do with like revolution and like that sentiment necessarily. It's more going back to um, that kind of like that maybe geometric abstraction or like certain angles um, in that, you know, I wouldn't, I'm not sure if I would define this exactly as street photography, but I was just thinking of like, you know, you don't always have to be shooting head on. I was thinking of different angles. Um, what if you were just walking and decided to tilt your camera up and um, see what was going on? <laughs> and I just put this in here to kind of plug the exhibition that I curated um, as part of my fellowship. That's going. It was supposed to be up in April, but now it's probably going to be up, we're saying June 30th, hopefully. Um, and this is a photograph by Dennis Rivera Pichardo. Um, it's not in our collection, it's going to be in that exhibition. But this, while this one is more candid, spontaneous by Marcela Taboada, this one is more in documentary photography or photojournalism. I feel it will, I think it was originally published in the New York Times. Um, and it, it is more documentary photojournalism. Um, but I just thought it was cute, those visual um, um, relations. Here's another one of like an angle um, of a candid photograph um, and maybe those remnants of um, surrealism by Yolanda Andrade. Here's one by Danny Lyon, who is part of the, um, he was one of the pioneers of the new journalism movement, um, but he's really more of a documentary photographer uh, because he, focus more on, you know, social documentary. Um, but this one I feel is a little different from the usual dandelion photographs that we see. Um, and yeah, it's more, more candid, I feel, than other of his photographs, which you could say are just documentary photographs. Um, so, but yeah, this is in Mexico, which is why it's, it's included here, um, but also just these these lines and that sort of angle um, I found interesting as also the remnants that I've been talking about. And then I included this one, it's uh, circa 1900, um, definitely the oldest photograph, it's a photochrome um, in this print viewing, but also probably one of the oldest in our collection because we're more of a contemporary photography museum um, but this is um, just to bring back that sort of like ethnographic uh, photography um, I mean I think this can fa fall under like um, it could be street photography if we um, if it was taken now and notice that little dog there that I <laughs> brought up earlier you're going to capture dogs if you take photographs in Latin America. Um, I feel if it was taken 
now you could say like this is almost like street photography but also could be travel photography before this time and you know what photographers like William Henry, Henry Jackson were doing it, it really is more ethnographic because they're trying to capture like certain people and um, doing like this geologic um, geographic survey and uh, also just know that this is pre-revolution Mexico this was before the Mexican revolution um, 1910 um, to overthrow the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz. So um, every other photograph I saw you in Mexico um, was post-revolution Mexico to get back to that kind of like revolutionary sentiment. Like, do you see something different from this photograph and the ones that I, aside from clearly this is very old, but do, does it capture a different sentiment, a different feeling? Um, this is also by William Henry Jackson. You know, this one is even more like ethnographic in that way. And then here is another pre-revolution photo, but um, if I could like not tell you where it was, I would maybe have you guess like where do you think this is? Uh, but this is pre-revolution Cuba. And something interesting about this image is that, you know, the, just also the, um, you can see a lot of US brands all over Sherwin Williams, Coca Cola, and then or gift sh gift shop in English. Um, in the center is like one Cuban brand, Hathaway. I believe Hathaway is a um, Taino name. Um, La Gran Cerveza de Cuba, the beer of Cuba. So if you go to Latin America, honestly, even though this is from 1950 a lot of places will look like this. And also you see the political posters as well. Um, so you'll see like a lot of US brands, but then like these random, like more local brands. Um, and I like to say like, if you wanted, want to know what Cuba would have looked like without a revolution, uh, go to Puerto Rico. Um, and it'll actually kind of look like this <laughs> image. I, and I love this image um, as a candid, um, that says a lot, even though it seems kind of spontaneous. Um, Esther Parada, she traveled to Latin America um, a lot, and I believe this might be in Bolivia um, because she took other photographs in Bolivia and they look to be um, similar or in the same time, even though it says unknown, no, no date. I would guess that this is Bolivia. And again, like this is travel photography because the photographer traveled a lot to Latin America. This is street photography. Um, then this one is by Thomas Hawker in El Salvador. Um, you know, is this also, is this travel photography as well? Um, or is this street photography? Um, I would say she's not exactly looking at the camera. And again, that doesn't take away from a photograph that falls into the street photography, if they look at it, um, I think there's still a sort of candidness. I don't think she's like posing exactly for the camera. Um, but again, because he's American, is there's like an ethnographic angle to this or, um, or is this just part of his like travel photography compendium? And then here's one by Susan Meselas, and this is a very well known, um, photograph. This is more documentary because um, she's a Magnum photographer and she took several photographs of the Nicaraguan revolution. And here I go back to revolutionary sentiment across Latin America. Um, uh, during uh, the 1978-79 Nicaraguan revolution led by the Sandinistas um, Liberation Front um, to overthrow the Somoza regime. And so, you know, here's, even though this is clearly more documentary and she was sent kind of on assignment and um, to capture this, I just kind of wanted to include it because I think it goes with this discussion of like, what happens if you go to a country that is under constant political upheaval and, you know, you're taking photographs and then something spontaneous happens and that or and that spontaneity is just like upheaval and like or civil rights um um so rights what's the word um 
I forgot the word in English. Um, but, but yeah, um, that's why I wanted to include this one here. Um, and then this one, it, it might look candid, spontaneous. It might look like protest photojournalism even. Um, but this is a newer acquisition to our collection. Uh, we acquired several works by artist Jean-Marie Salvador recently. Um, so this one is from 2012. It's by Frank Rodriguez, who's more of a performance artist, and he stages these like actions. Um, and you know, I included this because I feel it goes into like, you know, this might look like photojournalism. So like, therefore, maybe it's not street photography, but it kind of comes from that tradition of like capturing a spontaneous or the decisive moment. Um, but it's really, it's staged. Um, he had people like turn over that bolki um, and he jumped on it. It's like a performance um, staging a, a sort of protest photo. Um, so, so yeah, and um, in the my exhibition Temporal, um, we're gonna see kind of like the photojournalism, documentary photography, and um, protest photography, which I honestly think protest photography, even though it falls under photojournalism, is kind of its own genre as well. Um, you are gonna see my interest in all of that also in the, in the exhibition Temporal, which is coming soon, hopefully June 30th. Um, but I guess it's time maybe for some questions before I ramble on. Uh, we can still take 10 minutes. I think I went over like five minutes, um, but I can still stick around for questions and discussion. Uh, okay, am I seeing this correctly? <laughs> Uh, a message from Amara, uh, I mean Rebel Betty, <laughs> one of the artists. Um, as I was talking earlier um, about the definition of Latinx, um, Amara points out that um, she identifies as a Black Indigenous Boricua, and Boricua is um, kind of an Afro-Indigenous term for Puerto Rican. It, it's kind of trying to go back to the roots, like before colonization, not of just of US, but of Spain as well. So Puerto Rico was originally called Borican or Borinquen by the Tainos. So some people prefer to, some Puerto Ricans prefer to be called Boricua um, because it kind of points to that. So, so yeah, like, like I mentioned in the beginning, some people who um, fall into like Latinx, Latin America, or who are from Latin America, um, prefer to use other terms. And, wait. Okay, I'm trying to see. All right, I'm trying to catch up with uh, the chat. I've actually, I don't have a lot of experience with the Q&A. <laughs> so even though I lectured you all to use that, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Kristen, I don't see the part where I can mark the answers as, um, as the questions as answered. But I'm hitting Delina. the Q&A. Do you want me to just read them to you, Delina? I think so, because I'm hitting the Q&A thing here and it doesn't open anything. It might be my computer. Okay, I'll um, just read them to you. Um, the first one is from William Camargo, and he says, in talking about Latin American photography, can we expect more elevation of Latinx photographers that were either born or raised in the US? Seeing how Latinx artists born and raised in the US get shown less in museums than those born in La Latino America. Mm -hmm. Latinx artists born and raised. Hmm. So you, um, maybe you're referring to like 
um, by saying that uh, Latinx artists born and raised in the U.S. get shown less in museums than those born in uh, Latin America. Um, I'm not sure about the statistics of that. Maybe um, just because in general Latinx slash Latin American presence in museums is abysmal, especially I think especially in photography. Um, but I guess uh, maybe what you're saying also is like photographers like Graciela Iturbide, Manuel Alvarez Bravo, Yolanda Andrade, we see those photographs maybe more um, in more commonly in museums because they have kind of like that historical significance. Um, as for expecting more elevation of Latinx photographers that were either born or raised in the US, I think that's also why I started off with um, kind of like Rebel Betty and um, and talking about what we define as Latinx as Latin American. Um, I, I'm not sure about um, whether they get shown less uh, statistically, um, but I think as far as um, elevation of Latinx photographers born in the US, I think first we need to really sort out all these categories surrounding Latinx and Latin American. And I think that's something for curators to also do that when we are um, exhibiting work, we kind of keep in mind all these intricacies like, uh, for example, in, in Temporal, um, my exhibition, um, I was thinking of all these things like, um, you know, Puerto Ricans in the diaspora and Puerto Ricans in the island who, and who I might want to, you know, exhibit. Um, but I kind of decided that I was going to make my show more about photographs taken in the island, but I was not um, going to define like whether the photographer was like, um, born in the island or or residing in the island um in temporal you'll see a mix of um mo i mean mostly photographers that were born in, but i think all the photographers were born and raised on the island in in the show temporal and um but some of them currently reside in the u.s and a couple um have spent a lot of time living in the u.s so even though they were born and raised in puerto rico they spent a lot of time in the u.s so, um, so as a curator, that's something I was thinking about. Um, like, do I, um, and I think some people who go to the show might say like, oh, there's not like a lot of diaspora here. And it's because it's specifically about um, the, the island. Um, but, but going back to like curators need to think about these categories. I mean, yeah, we need more shows that um, explore um, these terms and these identifications beyond like this Latinx and not to call anyone out or make fun, but um, we have to go beyond like this person explores their Latinx identity or um, there is so much more to explore just like in our barrios um, or, you know, just beyond like just personal identity. Um, we really need kind of like um, uh, maybe new terms or like putting older terms kind of like um, on the back burner um, and, and thinking about what that means in terms of like elevating Latinx photographers, whether in the US or Latin America. I just think it all fell, falls back to, we really need to think about these terms. Like maybe some of these people that we define as Latinx define us Afro-Indigenous, you know, or, or Indigenous. Um, um, another, oh, sorry, are you finished? I have another, a few okay. more questions if you're ready. Mm -hmm. um, Gabriela Vega asks, why do you think it's important to categorize the photographs such as street photography, travel, etc., when sometimes a project involves all types? Um, I would say that, you know, important to categorize um, I would say maybe for more like historical study, um, it, you know, if I'm going back and I'm looking at Jack Delano photographs and I look at them and I'm like, oh, these look like street 
this looks like street photography. Um, that's not very useful, like just seeing it and saying like that. I think it's useful to have the category there because, you know, having a category like documentary photography um, will help me like figure out like, oh, so he was hired by the Farm Security Administration to specifically go take photographs of like this, like subject matter. So it wasn't like spontaneous. So I think in that sense, um, the categorization is important. Or if we're talking about um, like Dawood Bay, like um, it might be, I would say that those are more street photography, but it's good to know that like, if we're categorizing it, it could fall into kind of travel photography because he wasn't born and raised there. Um, so, um, I think it's also important to think about the photographer's identity when we're uh, categorizing. Like if um, someone like William Henry Jackson, American, goes out into the world and <laughs> takes spontaneous photographs, um, is that street photography? Um, you know, or is his intent to capture these certain people kind of, you know, does that make it ethnography? And then we kind of see like the ethics of that as well. Oh, and that's another thing that I want to talk about before, but like the ethics of photographs, like street photography, there's a lot of discussion of, um, wait, let me, let me take the temporal thing here because it's kind of distracting me. <laughs> um, but like the ethics of street photography, the, the laws of whether you can take a, a photograph of someone in a public setting or, or um, yeah, in, in a public setting, it varies by country or sometimes even by region. In the US, it varies by state. Um, so I think it's important if we're like, oh, is this a street photograph that they were not going with the certain intent of like travel photography or documentary photography? Um, it was just someone going with a camera and taking photos of people randomly. Um, you know, I feel like in documentary photography, maybe there should be a little more discussion, like, oh, I'm gonna take a photograph of you and use you as this kind of example to document um, maybe a certain time, a certain movement, um, a certain moment. Um, whereas with street photography, I think, um, yeah, that kind of spontaneity could lead to different questions of ethics, um, like, because the person's not really like consenting. Um, and then that also gets to like artists' rights, like, will the artists have to, some photographers have had to go to court because of their street photography. Um, and I think part of their defense is that they're street photographers and that's their art form. Um, so I, I guess, the categorization, I think it's interesting to think like, it was this spontaneous street photography, was this documentary photographer hired by like the government, um, was this person a photojournalist um, on assignment specifically taking the photograph with the intent to publish? Um, I think all those, um, or was this person traveling and they decided to take these photos maybe personally, um, made for a personal thing and then that personal set of travel photo photographs ended up in a museum? Um, or was this photographer wanting to show like how the Latin, like Latin Americans live? And so he went and maybe with the intent of being a documentary photographer, but with that kind of like wanting to show a certain ethnicity and race and that I would prefer to categorize as like ethnographic in because there are certain implications in that. So that's why I think those categories are um, important, um, more so for the study and, and historicizing of it. But I, I think it's interesting that they're all malleable and there are blurred lines here. Um, yeah, great. Um, someone anonymously asked, is street photography an emergent form of image making in contemporary Puerto Rico? Or as one commenter mentioned, what is the role of community photography in Puerto Rico now given the recent economic crisis and the aftermath of recurring natural disasters on the island? Yeah, thank you. That's a cool question. Um, so if uh, the person's asking if um, 
street photography is kind of an emerging form of photography in contemporary Puerto Rico. Um, I would say not technically what I would define. Well, I mean, I think it depends on whether the photographers are taking it with the intent of it being published in, and maybe they're on assignment or, or they happen to take it and then like, that it, with the intent of like, oh, maybe this could be published. Um, I think that's a little bit more photojournalism. Um, I think some photographers in Puerto Rico have dedicated themselves to taking photos of like certain moments, like either the protests or if we go back to Hurricane Maria, which wasn't that long ago, going back to Hurricane Maria. Um, I think in Hurricane Maria, there was more of an emergence of like documentary photography because there was a certain subject matter that they wanted to document. And it was kind of both documentary photography and photojournalism if they were taking it on assignment. Um, whereas street photography, I don't know, because I think the protest photography that's taken, they go in with at least the intent that they know it's a, there's, a, there's protests going on. Um, uh, I don't see, I guess, as much of like, um, like randomly <clears throat> going in and taking photos. I think you would see a lot more tourists <laughs> in the photos if it was like regular street photography. I feel like photographers, photographers in Puerto Rico are being very intentional with who they take photographs of and they want to show the Puerto Rican people. Um, so um, yeah, in, in Temporal, the exhibition I curated, you're going to see, um, I, I chose deliberately a mix of things that I thought fell under the photojournalism umbrella, but even that um, maybe is pushing a little bit because some of them, some of the people in the, sh in the show, some of the photographers there, they were for New York Times or, or Time <laughs> Magazine, or they published in Time Magazine or Ape for Associated Press. Um, some have published in more like Latinx um, outlets like Remezcla. Um, one of them, one of the photographers in my show was hired by FEMA actually to kind of document um, uh, Post Maria. So he was actually maybe not quite a photojournalist, but like a documentary photographer for FEMA. Um, so um, yeah, I just kind of keep that in mind if you do go see the show or see digital, the digital um, components I will put up for that show that I was thinking of photojournalism, but you know, if you see things about Hurricane Maria, it might fall more into documentary. Um, but um, but yeah, to answer your question, is it an emerging form street photography? I would say not quite because of like the Puerto Rican photographer's certain intent to capture um, certain moments in, in recent Puerto Rican history. Um, it's like, they might look spontaneous and candid, but I feel like um, they're kind of deliberate in, in, a, in a different way. Um, so, so yeah, hopefully that uh, kind of answers your question. Hinda Seif, I hope I said that right, has asked, um, she said, most of these street photos seem to be taken by people visiting a place, not of the place. What are examples of street photographers taking photos of the streets in their own community? Is it called street photography in this case too? And then she says, when I say visiting a place, they may live in the same city, but seem like an outsider to the community they are photographing. Mm. Yeah, I think that goes back to like the categorization of um, or like why it's important to have these certain um, categories. Um, I would say that um, just intent matters and the way we view the photograph matters. Like a lot of photographs I show, they kind of seem to fall into street photography, but because the photographer was maybe American and traveling there, it seems more travel photography or ethnographic. And I think you're also pointing to, let me see, um, like certain ones of like the Mexican photographers um, that maybe they're not like, um, even though they're photographing in Mexico, <laughs> Mexico is a very big place. So there might be certain regions of Mexico that they're photographing that they're not of. And I think that is the case for a lot of them. 
um, I think it would depend on their intent. Like if the photographer said, um, I, I want to show uh, this certain region of Mexico, I am Mexican um, and I'm going to the certain region to capture the people kind of spontaneously. But I think once it has that sort of intent of like, I am going to, to capture a certain region and these, um, it, it starts to bleed more into documentary photography, I would say. Um, so yes, I think it does depend on, on the intent of the photographer um, and where they're coming from, like you said. And I think that's maybe one of the keys um, that, um, uh, that I've been talking about, like, oh, this kind of seems like it's street photography, but there's something about it. Um, I think often it might be like the photographer is coming from this different place. Um, and I'm just kind of like going back on this presentation here, but um, let me, oh, we're, I skipped. Uh, Jack Delano is, I think, a, a good example of that. Like he was born in the Ukraine, raised in the US, hired by the US to go take photographs of Puerto Rico, but he remained in Puerto Rico until he died and he um, raised his family there. So he, he became kind of an honorary uh, Puerto Rican. Um, and if you Google Puerto Rican photography, what's gonna pop, pop up is Jack Delano. Um, and so I have this book by Jack Delano. You will probably see this book pop up if you look up um, Puerto Rican photography. And it's titled uh, Puerto Rico Mio, which translates to my Puerto Rico. So it's interesting that though Jack Delano was hired to be sort of this documentary photographer by the US, eventually he just kind of became part of the community. And so does that start to lose like its documentary thing if he's just maybe starting to take photos spontaneously more of like his friends or his now extended family in Puerto Rico? Because um, I think his son was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I'm sure he, I know he considers himself Puerto Rican. Um, but, but yeah, like is it more documentary or does it lose that once he became part of uh, this community. Um, yeah, I think those are uh, things to think about. But, but yes, I would say it kind of comes down to intent and maybe um, just the, the moment um, when it's happening. Because um, if you're going to, a, like, if you're visiting a country that you know, um, like, if you visit it, Puerto Rico last summer while the protests were happening and you were like, I'm gonna go out and take photographs spontaneously. Um, I would say that then that changes the intent. Um, it even changes from being travel photography. It suddenly becomes like, oh, I know that this is happening. So I'm gonna go document this certain moment. Um, so yeah, I think it, it comes down to intent and the ph photographer's own um, placement and how they recognize that um, and how they feel about the photograph they're taking too. If they're doing it more spontaneously and candidly and like, um, like this by Dawood Bay, I would, the reason I included Dawood Bay is like, even though it's kind of travel photography, I'm not sure he would call it that. I would say that this really, to me, this seems like street photography as well. Cause I feel like he was just capturing these certain um, moments, but um, you know, it depends, like, if he says, like, oh, no, I wanted to, this is just, like, a travel set of Puerto Rico, um, and I intentionally went to these places and wanted to take a photo of Ponce and one of San Juan's storefronts, you know, it, it changes. So hopefully that answers part of your question, but definitely look up Jack Delano's history in Puerto Rico. Um, well, Delina, we're about 20 minutes over. There are a few more questions, but I think we should probably wrap it up and then um, maybe you could answer them on our website on the resource page for people to see there. Yeah, I could, I could do that. Um, yeah, I just saw the Q&A pop up and then it disappeared, but yeah, I, I can answer the rest of your questions and um, uh, definitely check out um, the exhibition that's going up 
if you want to see more about photojournalism, um, temporal. And let me do a quick plug of upcoming uh, Behind the Lens this Friday, a Puerto Rican photojournalist, or we'll see if he calls himself a photojournalist, uh, Christopher Gregory Rivera, um, uh, Friday at noon. We're doing a Behind the Lens with him and I'll be there, but talking way less. Um, Sorry. And then next week, photos at soon with uh, Karina Send the Image with curatorial assistant Emily Plunkett, um, who's awesome. Um, and yeah, go to photos at soon on our website if you want to see this PDF, uh, these images, and um, some more links for further reading. And um, yeah, I'll try to answer more of your questions separately. If, um, but thank you. Thank you for being here. Sorry for going over. <laughs> okay. Do I log off? <laughs> All right.